Welcome to the Nicola Valley Talk Show, a product and experience Nicola Valley program. Broadcasting from my, my room out in my home, practicing safety and health while isolating myself so no one else gets sick or I don't get sick. Um, the Nicola Valley Talk Show is broadcasted every Thursday on our Nicola Valley Facebook page at 7 p.m. Pacific time. I am your host, Tanya Stewart as well as an eco-blogger for Experience Nicola Valley. Okay, I'm very excited tonight about our guest. Many people will know her as a member of a family who have owned various bars, nightclubs, hotels, and have been, have been a, a name in the Merritt and Nicola Valley for many, many years. And we all love them. So welcome, Dana Egan. Thank you, Tanya. I'm very, very happy to have been asked to come on your show tonight. Well, I'm very happy that you're here. Okay, so Dana, I, yeah. again, I'm very happy to have you here and very excited to um, ask you some questions and to show the merit in Nicola Valley, who you are and, and exactly um, what you do and everything else like that. So let's get started with the first question. Dana, please provide us with a snapshot of yourself, a kind of bio of sort. Okay, well, I guess we have to go back to when I was six years old and my family bought uh, the Coldwater Hotel. We lived in North Vancouver at that time. And I mean, my brothers were already born. Um, we moved to Merritt, lived in the Coldwater Hotel for six months while our house was being built up here on the bench. And uh, I mean, things progressed. I mean, I think my very first job was counting uh, the money that came out of the shuffleboard at the Coldwater, as well as uh, like, cause the bar was closed on Sundays back then. So that was the only day I got to spend with my dad. So he said, come on down, we'll count money and you can put the chips and the cheesies up on the little rack. And uh, you know, I got to meet the characters down at the hotel and um, anyways, uh, and further on, I mean, I went to school here graduated in 1975, then I went on to university at UBC and then transferred to U of A and got a degree in recreation administration with a minor in planning and management, also in heritage interpretation. And always, I guess my field has been hospitality and tourism because my parents were just the, the best super hosts you could have ever known. They were lots of fun. My dad always told lots of jokes. There was always, when we, when we had our pub at the Val Nicola Hotel, he was down there playing piano and telling stories. And uh, then after that, they retired for a few years. And then he and my brother and my mom bought the Grand in 1996. And I guess that's the rest of the story. I've been there ever since. However, I do have another degree from uh, Capilano College. I'm a legal assistant. Uh, I've got some other uh, education in business administration. And I just love, I always keep coming back to the hospitality industry. It's just, it's just in my blood. Wow, what a, uh, like, what a background you have. What was it? What was the, the other one? I, I kind of missed that one. The last um, thing you did. Um, I went. Uh, well, I, I got my uh, paralegal or paralegal or it's a legal assistant degree from Capilano College, and then I have an online course in business administration, and I've got a couple of. I mean, I'm always upgrading, going back to school. In fact, even during the two months that we were off during COVID, mm -hmm. after I'd done all my um, housekeeping and got my books caught up with this, <laughs> that, and the next thing, I took some online marketing. So, you know, it's just always education. Busy, busy. And busy, that legal, um, the paralegal must really help you with your business? It does, because you have to be aware of the various statutes. Um, as we go into some of the other questions that you want to ask, I think I can elaborate more of that. Okay, great then. Okay, a lot. Uh, you're really interesting. I mean, wow, eh? a lifetime of learning, I guess. You'll never stop learning, probably. We no, but the, anyway. the other things that I've always been, I, I was always an athlete in high school and even played fastball up until probably my mid-40s. Uh, I played uh, some uh, uh, 
what do you call it? Uh, it was men's and ladies fastball. So like a co-op and it was a lot of fun. I met a lot of great people through my life, uh, just in my industry that I'm in, as well as all the sports that I played in. Wow. Well, that leads us into question number two, Dana. Could you provide our listeners the background of how you and your family became owners of the Grand? Okay. Well, like I say, we had the cold water and then we had the Val Nick. And then in nine, about 1992, my parents decided they were going to retire. And, you know, retirement is when you're that young. They were probably my age at that time, which I'm not going to tell you what my age is. But anyway, they were probably that my age. And then they retired for four years. And then the grand came up and my brother Patrick was interested in doing something else because he'd screwed up his knee and he couldn't work at the mill anymore. So my dad said, yeah, come on, let's buy the grand. So that's what they did. And my mom always had a great eye for renovations. She she came up with the outside of the building as well as all the interior uh, changes that we made. Uh, we came up with the poor man's fake, uh, you know, brass ceiling. And it was, you know, it's it's been a real experience. Yes. And we all love the Grand. I mean, that's one of my favorite places. And I w actually was... Um, lucky enough to even work there for a bit. Yes, you were, you're good work, that you're was a good great. server, yeah. Thank you. Um, so on to our next question, Dana, how has it been through the years and the changes that you and your family have faced? Like the ups and downs, the hurdles, um, the great things and just anything. Mm -hmm. Well, of course, the, the positive things are all the wonderful people that we've met through all the years. So if you go back to 1963, uh, there were through the 60s and into the early 70s, there were all kinds of beer strikes. So, you know, and also mine strikes and mill strikes, well, forestry. Um, and like I say, the breweries had strikes. So there were times when my, when my parents had to be very, very creative in order to just get product to sell. And so I can't really tell you this online, <laughs> however, but my dad was very creative and uh, our patrons never went without, let's put it that way. Um, <laughs> also, since we've owned the Grand, we've had, I mean, everybody knows that most of the laws are changing. You can't smoke in public places anymore. Um, there was, the, in 2008, there was the market crash. And I mean, it took a long time for us to come back from that. But prior to that, we just renovated the kitchen at the ground. That cost us about $200,000. Wow. You know, so there's always something. I mean, with the smoking thing, we had to put up that that plastic or the, the wall that mm -hmm. everybody still sees to this day. And I'm so glad we never took it down because at least now, even though there's no smoking, it does offer some privacy up in that in the upper area. So nobody's jumping over from the bench into the other side. And it just makes it a, a lot more classy, private place for people to go and dine and have an experience. Were, were you guys the owners of the Val Nick when it had that fire? Yes, we were. We'd only had it for six months. And I was very, very, very unfortunate. Um, one of the guys that had come to try out for the Merit Centennials. Uh, as the story goes, the the fellow had an argument with his girlfriend and then decided that he would just, and in those days, the old Val Nick had rooms along the back part. Um, so he had one of the lower rooms and he apparently sat in his room, threw a book of matches underneath the bed. And that was before they had the, the blocks that, if you go into a room now, you can't get underneath the bed, right? In most yeah. places, because there was just a bed frame, right? But now they have a block that the, the actual um, box spring sits on. So you, there's no underneath the bed anymore anyways. And that's what he had done is he threw some matches underneath, sat in his room, watched TV until he couldn't see for smoke. And then he jumped out the window and the rest wow. is history. Two people died and it was very, um, very, very unfortunate. Well, you know what? I can I can share a little story here with you and, and on our listeners. We, my family, we were living in Kengard Manor at that time. And when the fire broke out, everyone, I guess it was a town thing, they, everyone came and, and watched watched it. And it always stuck out in my mind that when that happened. Yeah. And 
Uh, wow. Because I think it was one of the biggest fires I'd ever seen. I, I mean, I was, I was pretty young. I think probably about six. Yeah. So you weren't alive when, when the grasslands first burnt down? No, no. Oh, because no. I remember that too. I mean, we've had some very horrible hotel fires in town. In the grasslands fires, I think they had three fires. I don't think anybody was ever killed. Um, anyways, it's just just wow. the, the, a very horrific thing that, that happens to whoever it happens to. I mean, in yeah. our family, it, it set us back a long ways, you know, because even though my dad had, before he got, got into the hotel business, he sold insurance in Vancouver. Oh. And because he had only, he had sold the cold water and bought the Valnick, thinking that he would only have it for a year and then to flip it. And then he told my mom that he says, yeah, we're ready to flip it. And this was Labor Day weekend, six months after we bought it. They were in Vancouver trying to sell it when the, when the fire happened. So, oh, you know, so anyways, he didn't insure it enough because he just wanted to flip it. So we oh, didn't I have 100% worth of insurance. So, I mean, everything that happens, it just sets you back and sets you back, right? Yeah. But I think, you know, if, if we can say if we've been in business in Merritt since 1963 and it's almost 2023, <laughs> we've been in business for 57 years in this town. So I think we're successful. I think so, too. Holy. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Um, and my grandfather used to tell me as mm -hmm. long as he says, Dana, if there's ever, you know, a pandemic, not saying COVID, but if there's ever, you know, something that happens that you know the economy turns he says as long as you're paying your staff and you're keeping people employed and you're paying your bills he says then you're successful don't worry about it and i agree with him wise words yes very wise words now that we've heard a lot of your the history and and the business and the owner or you guys owning these businesses and and um everything so when a person goes to the grand like me or, or someone just traveling down to Coquihalla and decides to come in, you know, Googles and sees the grand and yeah. oh, we can bring our kids in there too, right? What kind of experience is would a person expect? Okay, well, we do have a couple of slogans. One is we are your hometown hospitality specialists. So we mm -hmm. expect that when you come in, you're going to be treated like our neighbor. We're going to treat you like gold. We want you to have good food and we're not fast food. So sometimes there is a bit of a wait, but our food is all home cooked. Chef Don has, uh, we've downsized the menu since COVID started just to make sure that everything is coming out fast and or as fast as we can. Um, it just depends on what time people come in. If everybody come piles in at five o'clock, then you're gonna wait a little bit. But um, you know, we've got good food and good service and grand times. We've got a great uh, beer and cocktail and cider and cooler and wine menu. So come on in, try it out. We've got, it's more expansive than any, any other place in town. We now also have our patio. Uh, we can see 30 people out there provided that there's, you know, six people per group because the new COVID rules say you can't have any more than six people. And I want people to, really remember that because i know we have some groups coming in well there's eight of us can't you just squeeze in two more chairs no i'm sorry it's law you got to listen to dr bonnie henry you know she knows what's going on and i and i agree she's been considered one of the foremost uh health doctors regarding covid in the world right now so i'm gonna listen to her i hope i hope everybody, <laughs> all my patrons do too we also have uh directional arrows on the floor that, you know, we've got uh, sanitizing stations. We're limiting the number of people that can go into the washrooms. We want one person to come in. If, if you wanna go onto the patio, just have one person come in, let us know that you're there. And then you can open the gate and let everybody in. You know, if we're just trying to be as accommodating. We want people to be safe and we want everybody to trust us. Wow, yeah. I, I drove by and I seen that patio. It sure looks nice. Thank but you. I, you know, I, I, all, all of the people that put that together for us in such short amount of time and on short notice, they're all local with the exception of the, the fellow that put the turf in. They're called Beyond the Turf. Um, he's a best friend of my brother, Rick, 
Actually, Pierre used to be uh, one of Ricky's original caregivers when he first was injured with his quadriplegia. And he's gone off and now he does uh, stadiums internationally. So he gave me a really good deal. And uh, I'm telling you, you can feel it on your wow. feet. You know, it's, it's just <laughs> like walking on velvet. I love it. Yeah. Yeah. And the table, the tables that I have out there, I bought from a pub that I used to work at in Kelowna. They're solid concrete. And I want to tell everybody, please don't try and move them. We've put them in exactly the spots that we want them to be in. So people are spatial different distance mm -hmm. and they weigh 400 pounds. So don't oh. hurt yourself. Don't <laughs> try and move them. No kidding. You can throw your back out. I know. But we had them all cleaned up. They look like brand new, but they're, they're oh, amazing. Wow. Yeah. I can't wait to see. That's well, you have some, Tanya. I will. I will. Yeah. Actually, I think I might be going taking a friend out on Thursday. Okay. So. Well, I have some other things. Um, we were getting some, uh, like the back wall is six feet to act as a windbreak, but we were finding that it's not quite enough windbreak. So I've got some lattice built that's going up in the next day, or maybe if it didn't happen today, it'll be tomorrow. Um, we've got some other things coming: lights, music, cameras going out there. Going to be, it's going to be great. Well, and, and that's kind of like, I think you touched a lot on, on this next question, but feel free to add more, is what makes the Grand stand out from other different pubs? Um, well, I really don't like to compare us to anybody else. Okay. We have, uh, we've, we've got history, like I keep saying, we have the history. So we know people in town and people know us. And I, I'm very, very strong on, on making people happy. If you've got a complaint, please let me know. Don't walk out the door and, and complain to somebody else because if you don't tell me, how can I change anything? And I want you to leave with a positive experience. I want you to come back. So, you know, get on Facebook, get on Messenger. And we're also going to be having our online ordering starting like within the next week or so. Um, you go to www.grandpuband andgrill.net and you'll find our new web page and it has the online ordering there and also i did mention it earlier about um kids coming in can come in right yes but during covid now because of this phase that we're in we're only allowing children 10 years old and up oh, because oh. it's just really hard for us to manage little kids from running around and it they tend to have more sniffles you know, yeah. I just don't want to put anybody at risk, especially the little kids, right? Yes, definitely. Well, that's good to know. Yeah. I did not know that, and that's yeah. awesome. Yeah. So, Dana, could you share with our listeners what is special about the Nicola Valley and oh why? Oh, my God. What <laughs> isn't special about the Nicola Valley? And you know, I, I, moved back, I moved back here from Kelowna in 2000, and mm -hmm. I thought to myself, okay, I'm only going to be here for a little while. I'll probably move back to Kelowna because I really liked it in Kelowna. Lots of cultural activities, et cetera, et cetera. <laughs> but you know what? Merritt has it all. We are small enough, but we're still country. Mm -hmm. We're two hours from Vancouver, an hour from West Bank, an hour from Kamloops. We've got it all. And, you know, if uh, even if you just want to come in for a dining experience, that's fine. But if you want to stay and enjoy the outdoors, there's fishing, hunting, cross-country skiing. Um, what else? I mean, anything you want to do in the outdoors. You can go trekking. You can go um, um, mountain biking. Mm -hmm. I mean, there's different uh, events that are going on here for that. I know that we don't have the festivals right now, but I mean, Bay's Coast has a virtual one going on uh, that, that was on last week. There's going to be all kinds of new things happening. As long as you pay attention to your spatial distancing, be considerate of everybody that's around you. I'm sure there's going to be more and more things that we can enjoy here. We've got a great museum. We've got fastball slope, or we don't have fastball, pardon me. We've got slow pitch now. I mean, there's lacrosse, there's the little bike park just down down the hill here from where I live with all the jumps and everything. There's so much to do here. You'll save money and have a quality experience because what I find the best about the Nicola Valley is our people. And one thing I've found out from having all these hundreds of fundraisers that we've had at the pub is that 
people want to help people, whether it's a community organization, whether it's somebody that's had a fire, whether there's somebody that's got a disease and they need to raise money for a cure, Merit is behind them 100%. And that's what I love about Merit is the people. Exactly. And and yeah. I find that too, that, um, and, and I have been to many of your, um, your steak fundraiser dinners and they're amazing. And, and yes, people want to help people in this town and we know everyone and, and we don't treat outsiders like outsiders That's you know right. where yeah. some towns kind of tend to do that like you're not a maritonian until you lived here 20 years we're not like that well, if I i'm walking into my pub and mm -hmm. we don't know your name by the time you leave i will be offended because <laughs> I, be I consider us kind of a cheers kind of bar you know mm -hmm. where everybody knows your name and so we can always give you the gears later you know <laughs> <laughs> And uh, we just want people to have a good time. We want we want people to leave saying, hey, that was a great little experience I had, and I'm gonna remember them, I'll be back. Well, I have to tell you, Dana, last summer, because um, my family usually goes there quite a bit for, for steak dinners and stuff like that, we had a couple from Kelowna who just loved the place, and they live in Kelowna, and they said, it felt like cheers. It was like, oh, good. No hey. <laughs> Yeah, and they, they're they just like, I want to come here all the time. And then COVID happened, and, and so we haven't had them over, but we hope to have them over, and, and that's the first place we'll end up going to because they awesome. just cannot stop talking about it. Oh, that's great. I'm very happy to hear that. Yes. It's like uh, when people post on Google or anything, I don't care if they even make a comment as, if, as long as they give me a rating or something, and I always reply, thank you for taking the time, you know, just to give us a rating or give us a comment. That's that says a lot to me because some people just go, oh, no, I'm not going to bother with that. So if you take that little bit of time, I love it. Yes. Yeah. So um, leading on to this next question, it's kind of a um, well, we have to ask this because what we're trying to do is promote businesses through town due to COVID-19 and, and everything and them shutting down. So due to the COVID and many businesses that had to shut their doors. How did it um, COVID-19 impact your business? Well, it was a little nerve wracking. I mean, because we found out at noon on March the 17th that we were supposed to be shut down by three o'clock and on, on March the 17th. So it was just like, okay, well, you got to follow them. You got to go with the protocol, right? You've got to follow along. So we did. And after a few weeks, you know, I got all my books caught up and I got my house cleaning done. And, and then I was like, okay, what am I going to do now? So anyways, for me personally, instead of, instead of uh, sitting around just watching movies and stuff, I, I went and I got some more self-education. I did some online marketing, which I think has benefited me. However, I, I didn't get to finish it because then we got notified that we we're going to be able to start up again. So I spent a lot of time, you know, creating the online uh, ordering and, you know, figuring out how many people we were going to have back and maybe we should downsize our menu and maybe we should shorten our hours. It was really all up in the air. So we really didn't know how it was going to operate until finally, maybe three days before I said, okay, this is what we're going to go with. I had some help doing some scheduling which uh, I think was eye-opening for the people that I had doing the scheduling, but it's all worked out for the best. Um, we are only open now from noon until 10 o'clock. The kitchen's only open from noon until 9.30. Um, we are still doing some catering if people can come up with the spatially distancing. So if you need catering, please give us a call, 378-4618, area code 250. Um, again, with the COVID, We've had some extra expenses, uh, which thankfully the uh, CERB has helped with. And, uh, you know, I, I guess the government has helped us a lot just to maintain and to be able to be open. So I'm thankful for that. Yes, very good. Um, and yeah, like, I mean, there are going to be places that aren't going to be reopening due to this. I know, lockdown. and I feel bad for them. 
I Me really do, but they should really look at all the options that are available to them out there because there are, and if anybody needs help, Hey, I'm, give me a call. I'm willing to help. Yeah. It's really not that difficult, but I so can hear that people. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'm willing that's to That's awesome. Yeah. Yeah. To, to, to offer your services. I mean, that's great. I mean, that's, and you don't, you want to see everyone succeed in their exactly. businesses. Like, you, I mean, you know you, what? It's so mm -hmm. sad because the city has gone or the various stores downtown have gone to all this extra effort to make the buildings look Western. You know, they're doing all the facades, those kinds of things that makes our downtown more welcome. Um, we need to have people coming downtown still. And it's usually, it's going to be those small shops downtown that are hurt the hardest. So if mm -hmm. everybody could remember to try and shop locally, it doesn't really matter if it costs you a little bit more because guess what? You're spending all that gas to go out of town for what? You want yeah. to drive business out of merit? Fine. But I think it's more important to support local. Uh, yeah, I, I've hear always you. thought that. Like that patio that I built, all local, except for Pierre. But he's another friend, so, <laughs> yeah. Well, you're still helping out a friend too, right? Yeah. Um, so now that you've reopened, how you can tell us exactly how long you've been reopened, but um, what precautions, I think you went through some, but let's yeah. go through some more. What precautions and safety protocols that you have taken? Okay, well, initially I hired uh, one extra person to be the health and safety officer. And what they did was make sure that they were, you know, basically disinfecting any surface that where somebody would touch right? Uh, it took us a little while to get the disinfect, the hand disinfecting uh, machines that are by the doors now and in the washrooms and in the kitchen and in the office. And I mean, by the, by where the staff sign in and out. Um, but initially we had hired uh, one person to do all that job. Now that things seems to be a little bit more streamlined, we don't need that person because now all the staff members are taking on those responsibilities. So you will see if you walk into the washrooms that there's a, a health and safety checklist and there's somebody in there every two hours making sure that everything is clean. We've had lots of people come up to us and say how safe they feel in our in our property just because of the protocols that we've done for a long time we had just disposable menus as well so uh the menus that we were giving to people like would be, they would share between two people who would just throw them out afterwards um and that was because people didn't know how long covid was living on paper so we just disposed of it now we've got the smaller the smaller menu and the smaller menu covers so they're being disinfected every time they're being touched by somebody so, you know, everything has been, the, the condiment machines, like I say, we've got the directional arrows. Uh, every surface that you touch will be hand cleaned by my staff. So I hope that you all feel, I mean, we don't wear masks, but that they should be keeping their distance, the service should be keeping their distance when they, when they come to your table, to take your order. And then at the same time, whoever delivers your meal will probably drop it in the largest space on the table and then have you pass the, pass the food around so that we're not reaching in between people. It's everything to keep spatially distanced. Which is good. Actually, I can testify to that because I did go there for a bite to eat and, and a quick beer and, um, and they were really awesome. I mean, good. they weren't in my face and yeah, it was great. I, good. And kudos to that because um, I'm sure there's places out there that aren't following that safety protocols and I'm hoping that everyone does. Yeah, I've heard that. I've heard that. But like I say, I don't worry about what anybody else is doing. I try and just focus on what we're doing. That's good. So yeah. Dana, as we're closing down our, our little chat here, which was has been just amazing. Um, is there anything else you want to add? Yes, I do. I've actually I've, I've handwritten most of these. Okay. But mostly this is just a thank you. So uh, I just want to, I'm just going to read this so I, I don't forget. I'm just so pleased and thankful to everyone who has come to the pub since we've opened on May the 19th this year. I'm thankful to everyone who, who has taken the time to tell us how clean our property is and how impressed they are with how safe they feel. And that means the world to me. I'm also thankful to my staff who've returned and are dealing with all the new protocols and 
retraining that we are doing. Um, it's been a crazy busy time and they're all holding up well. I'm thankful also to my family who continue to support me and my decisions during this unpredictable pandemic. And my thanks to you, Tanya, and to Nicola Valley Talks for giving me the opportunity to uh, talk about my property, the Grand Pub and Grill. And I hope to see you there soon. Oh, yes, I hope so too. Well, Dana, thank you. It's very informative and I think people are just gonna love to to watch this so what you need to do is pump it up and throw it out there and tell everyone because you're a star now <laughs> <laughs> you did an awesome oh, job man. you're embarrassing me no, okay no, well thank no. you tanya this has been you're great natural. You i've are. been hiked up all day <laughs> <laughs> well thank you so i'm going to let you go and i'm going to close off the session here okay, okay thanks. Again, thank have you, a great Danny. evening I'm okay. grand. Night, thank night. you well everyone wasn't that awesome wasn't she great i mean dana egan everyone like she's just like she is in in person she is at the grand she's just true blue you know you get what you see and that is amazing because she is a great person Her, the whole family is i can attest to that so again um this is a nicola valley talk show a product of experience nicola valley program broadcasting from my um, bedroom, my old bedroom, actually what I grew up in, <laughs> and because um, I, I live in my old house, but anyways, and uh, so always on 7 p.m. Pacific time on Thursday, you can find it on Experience um, Nicola Valley Facebook page, and again, I'm your co-host and your host, I guess, Tanya Stewart, and um, as well as an eco- eco blogger so as saying that as an eco blogger i always try to practice the th the four r's which is reduce recycle reuse and rethink what you ne really need because we want to keep our landfills less well empty really that's what we want but um but less full i guess okay so signing off and see you in two weeks time <laughs>